Yeah. Hey, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for inviting us because sure. it's also with a tweet. Yes. I think a couple of months ago where I said, okay, then I do, give me one and a half hour of your time and I will get, uh, and, and I will crowdfund the money to get to you uh, by using your platform. <laughs> yes. What, what did you thought when you uh, saw the tweet? Oh, I thought that was super creative and innovative and out of the box. And um, I just, like I was uh, saying before, like I love, I love to reward innovation or people who are willing to try something new, think creatively, and put themselves out there. And that's what entrepreneurship is all about. And so whenever I see any sign of that, I always try to respond and be as supportive as I can. And, and I think that's also the way that you started your uh, Indiegogo uh, quite some years yeah. ago. Can you share more about how you got the idea and how you got the first steps in building the, the platform? Do you want the long version or the short version? The short version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try to keep it short, yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, Indiegogo was, I was on the path to starting Indiegogo my whole life. I just didn't really know it. And it was only in sharing what motivated me to, to start it with others that uh, others pointed out to me that this is something that you've been that has been inside of you for a very long time. Um, and when I realized that, I realized that that was pretty true. Um, I grew up here in San Francisco and my parents were small business owners and I watched them struggle for 30 years because they could never get a loan. They could never get any kind of outside capital to help them grow and so they technically bootstrapped for 30 years. And I think that was the seed that just made me aware of how hard uh, finance and fundraising was. Uh, when I went into to, I went into finance after college to really understand how money worked and it was there that I actually started failing for some of the same reasons my parents were, had failed for many years. I had started working with filmmakers and theater producers on the side and um, was unsuccessful at helping them raise money not because they weren't willing to work hard but simply because they um, didn't know the right person and couldn't, didn't have the right connection to the gatekeeper that would say yes and help them finance it. Um, how I got into that was a little bit, uh, was very organic. Uh, I was working on, on Wall Street. I was a, a analyst by day. And uh, I had got invited to this event called Where Hollywood Meets Wall Street. And I, at the time, I was working about 100 hours a week. And I was like, oh, that's a great excuse to get out of the office. <laughs> um, and I, so I went. And what I was hoping to get out of it was the, was to, was the ability to listen to all the conversations that happened there. Like, what is what do Wall Street bankers talk to Hollywood producers about? And how does how do these big films get made and funded? Like, what does it take to for that to happen? And it wasn't that at all. It was the sea of emerging artists all hoping to meet their next angel. And because I literally had a JP Morgan on my name mm -hmm. tag, everyone thought I was full of money and everyone wanted to talk to me. So it was a very um, uh, surprising experience. But what hit home for me is two days later, I got a script from one of the filmmakers that I had met that night, an elderly filmmaker, and in it was a note that said, um, I look forward to you financing my film. And so uh, when I read it, that's when I really realized what was going on, and um, my heart sank. And um, I like to say I did what any young girl does when you're totally upset and distraught. I was about 21 or 22 at the time. Um, I called my mom and I called my mom to complain about the world and how unfair it was and how it's not America's not a land of all possibilities we're selling a fallacy all this stuff and after 20 minutes of venting she uh, she said well if you're really that pissed off about it go do something about it and then yeah. she hung up on me because she just, was running a business just saw the problem Bye. yeah cool. so that's what got me working with these filmmakers and theater producers I I wanted to help them raise money it was purely out of passion and love like these were people who were telling stories their whole life they just weren't getting any breaks, just like my parents. And so I worked on a couple different projects, but the big one that kind of shaped me the most and kind of opened the path to Indiegogo was a project that I worked with a director that I met that night at that event, and it was an Arthur Miller play. And the play was called Incident at Vichy, and it was a, it was a play about racial profiling that happened after World War II in France and Germany. and. This, at this time, when I was working on this, this was right after September 11th, and I was in New York City, and so racial profiling was a very big problem. So I thought this would be the perfect time to bring this play, and maybe I could help get it produced and stuff. So we put on a one-night event, a concert reading. We rented out a, a, a theater off Broadway in New York City, right near Times Square, packed it with an audience, got investors there to witness the whole thing. We got actors to volunteer their time to read the play to kind of show how it flowed. 
And the whole point was to get them it was get, to get the investors to witness the audience response to the actors and be impressed and then hopefully write the big check because that's how theater productions were, were financed back then. And everything went perfect except the last moment when I turned to the investors and I asked them, you know, are you going to invest? Like, did you, or I said, did you like it? They're like, that was great. And I was like, okay, so let's talk about investing. They're like, we're not interested. Sorry. Good luck. And it really was because I didn't have that off-Broadway or Broadway background. I was a nobody in that world, and I didn't know any of the right people. So once again, an idea died, not for lack of an audience or lack of uh, you know, this enthusiasm and passion from people that want to bring this idea to life, but simply lack of access to a gatekeeper that would make it happen. So that was the moment that I realized that finance was truly, truly broken, and that the way to fix it was um, to put the power back in the hands of the people to decide which ideas came to life. And that was the seed that le led me to business school um, to start a business to democratize uh, funding. I was focused on independent media at the time because um, that's where I was seeing the pain point most. And the idea I had was more of an offline fund with a democratic twist where all the investors got to vote and choose which ideas got funded. And so the, the investors, the people putting their money in, were the ones deciding which ideas got made. And um, by the time I got to business school, I'd been working on it for several, almost years, I guess, thinking about it. And I, I think I heard myself pitch it one too many times that I had to quit finance to leave. So then I went to business school, and that's where I met my first co-founder, Eric, who had been struggling helping a theater company in Chicago raise money. So he had a personal affinity towards what I was trying to do. And then he introduced us to Slava, our third co-founder, who himself, he had started trying to raise money um, for cancer research. Um, because his father had died of cancer when he was a young boy. So they all kind of were drawn to it. And they had come from tech backgrounds. And the moment they heard me kind of talk about the business of what I was trying to achieve, they instantly asked, you know, why? I think Slava asked, why, you know, why aren't you using the internet if you really want to democratize finance? And, and that's when I explained to him, you can't invest online. It's illegal in the United States. The secure SEC laws, all that stuff. But I would love to use it. It's much better. In, uh, mechanism. And now, uh, what year was it? This was back in 2006, um, and I my play experience was like 2002, 2003, somewhere back then. So it was. Um, I'd been working. I'd been. I'd actually left uh, uh, the investment side of finance to join the equity research side to cover the film and entertainment world, so that I could learn film finance and understand independent media and how all that stuff worked. But. And then I quit because I needed to start this business and I was ready to do it. But um, it's when we introduced the internet idea that things, we pivoted and um, the, the guys at that point decided to join. And at first we tried to navigate all the SC securities laws here in America and realized it was going to cost way too much money with money we didn't have. <laughs> um, and we realized we were trying to start a business, change the law, and prove that the internet was a great way to raise money all at the same time. And that seemed like probably uh, a doomed approach. So we put the investing piece aside, and that's when we came up with the perks concept, yeah. where if you can't get equity or profit in return for contributing to an idea, what could you get? And that's when we came up with the perks. And we said, let's just go prove the internet's a great way to raise money using this perks model, see if it works. Yeah. And it's stuck. And yeah. now we're today, fast forward, millions of dollars all across the world. Yeah, because we, uh, we, we just had a tour upstairs uh, in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people are working over here? It's, 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 it's huge. It's, we're growing, yeah. It's, it's been really amazing. We've, um, I think we're about just past 100, 100 people. So that feels quite large for us, <laughs> especially after many years. It's just the three of us. Yeah, and, 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 and how is it for you as a leader of a company? Because it's, it's first you start really from the heart yeah. uh, with two other people who were, uh, who were really motivated by passion yeah. uh, about uh, problems in daily life uh, where you're already yeah. mad of things not happening. Yeah. Um, and, and now the company is growing. And, 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 and what a way does it mean for you as, as a person, as a leader, uh, yeah. to, to, to make this change from a really a, a small, flexible organization to, to, a, a, to a bigger organization mm -hmm. where all people with other motivations uh, start working at your company? Well, what we've done, I think we've done a really good job on is um, very early when we, when we started, we are, were started, when we started to, sorry, <laughs> very early when we were able to start to hire people, um, we knew what they, we needed them to do, but we didn't know how we needed them to be. And we had um, 
uh, I had a little bit of a freak out moment. <laughs> I was like, how are we going to figure out what the right person, what does it mean to be a, a person that will fit our team? What does that mean? And so we did an exercise. I got my co-founders, and I think we had had two people already, our first two employees, around a table. And um, we did an exercise where everyone drew on a piece of paper and answered the question. They, they drew six pictures answering the question, I love coming to work at Indiegogo because. And in that process, we uh, realized that we all came to work for the same four reasons. And those, as we discussed them, what those reasons turned into was these are our values. This is what is this is what we believe as human beings first, and Indiegogo people second. And um, what we realized is like, well, then if we can go fire hire people that have different skill sets than us, different perspectives than us, different experiences, different backgrounds, because we you need that diversity to thrive. But the only the only thing they're not different than us on is those values that they wholeheartedly believe, those four things as well, then we'll have a company that can actually scale and that that will remain motivated for the same reasons we're motivated by. And and and, 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 and while growing a company, uh, you had to talk mm -hmm. to, 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 the, to, to the people who first uh, always say no to uh, when you ask, hey, do, you, do you want to give money for, for this mm -hmm. theater, to, to, for this piece? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what way did you, did you manage to, to, to get the right investors on board? Um, I think, uh, so Slava was in charge of raising money and in, um, well, we were all in charge of, I mean, we were all doing everything in the early days. Um, but I think we, our goal was to raise money in the fall of 2008 and uh, we ended up not raising our first round of capital until March of 2011. And um, along the way, uh, I think we were rejected by over 90 investors. <laughs> I think Slava stopped telling us at a certain <laughs> point because he didn't want to demoralize Eric and I, um, which is probably the right call. Uh, but, and he has a really thick skin, so he was, <laughs> he was good at weathering all of that. Um, but I think with every rejection came even more motivation to make Indiegogo work yeah. because that's what, that was the system that we're trying to, to, to break down and fix and remove the gatekeeper from, from the process. So that is, um, it was a bit, it was a bittersweet type of experience because it's like every time we got a rejection, it's like uh, frustrating, but it's like, this is why we exist. So it was even more fuel to keep going and achieve our, that mission, which was to democratize access to capital and literally empower everyone to fund what yeah. mattered to them, whatever yeah. that is. And uh, uh, when you started with, with, with the ideas that the, the whole loan and equity based uh, mm -hmm. was an option in, in, in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., no. So if we had launched Indiegogo with the ability to uh, offer people uh, the option to invest in something or to get an equity piece or profit participation, we would have been breaking the law. <laughs> so we couldn't do that. Um, but what, what's been great is when we put our uh, desire to democratize investing piece aside and just said, let's just focus on funding as a general phenomenon and um, prove that the internet is a great way to help people find their audience, raise more money than they ever could on their own. It's actually a more efficient way to allow people to get involved in ideas. Um, we would revisit the equity piece later. And uh, I think I remember saying in my head, we'll revisit it five, 10 years from now. And uh, it was within two years, though, that it came back up, which is, we had partnered with uh, Startup America, which was President Obama's entrepreneurship initiative here in the U.S. And um, we started working with the U.S. government and offering services to entrepreneurs through all their government programs. And then um, uh, uh, in parallel to that, there was a whole movement to allow companies like Indiegogo to offer equity because of our success. So our success to date then had proven that Indiegogo is a great way to get businesses, you know, money to get going. We've had, we had so many customers that had been rejected for a bank loan or rejected from a VC or couldn't get a VC call, to call them back. And so their idea was just stalled because they just needed capital to move forward and they weren't getting it. And so when they came to Indiegogo, they got it and we flourished and created jobs and we have so many stories. And so we just sent them all of our case studies um, and that actually helped um, the law change. So. And prior to that, it was actually fun. I actually ended up doing an Indiegogo campaign myself as a customer of our platform with a blogger and an attorney who, who felt that the law should change. And we used Indiegogo to raise $1,000 to 
pay a lawyer to write a petition to the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the U.S. to change the law, and that was the seed that actually born was born that yeah. that grew into the Jobs Act yeah. movement, which yeah. some lobbyists got, took hold and did a great job pushing forward, and then we were there supporting with case studies. So, yeah. it all came back around a lot more quickly, and now we're just waiting here in the U.S. for the regulations to be finalized. I know in Europe, the governments have moved forward yeah. and are are experimenting with stuff. I think the full impact of equity crowdfunding, though, will 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 be felt when it's a global phenomenon and it's not restricted just to specific yeah. countries. But you still want to also include uh, uh, equity-based crowdfunding uh, in, 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 in Indiegogo? We're very excited about it. It's definitely, I mean, it was always like what we wanted to do. <laughs> it was back to our, you know, our mission is to empower people to fund what matters to them, whatever that is, wherever they are, whoever they are, <laughs> however they'd like to fund. So whether it's for to a charity and they want a tax deduction or to a friend who, is going through a tough time and has medical bills that they can't cover, to an artist or a filmmaker that wants to bring a film to life, uh, to a business that um, either wants to offer perks, uh, coffee as perks, or maybe they do want to give up equity. Yeah. Um, yeah. We want to give everybody um, all the options yeah. so that they can do what, they, what is right for them. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also a step that you have to make because in the end, uh, also in the Netherlands, you see uh, different platforms already are uh, offering different kind of crowdfunding. Where they first started uh, only with uh, with lending or, or with equity, they're now also turning their model mm -hmm. to to also do the the, the perks uh, mm -hmm. uh, version. So it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's very interesting. And and what way do you think the 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 responsibility of a platform? Because what you see in the Netherlands, we uh, you got two different platforms: the more donation and, and, and perks, mm -hmm. and the uh, equity loan uh, platforms. And, and you see the, also, it's nice to see the founders of the, especially the loan platforms, that they're, they're, they're almost all, uh, uh, all formal bankers. Mm -hmm. So the process of of, of, of of getting a okay, you can uh, put uh, put your your idea on a platform is 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 also similar to what's happening in a bank. Um, there are other platforms also in in equity uh, side where they say okay, uh, just put your idea uh, on, on on a platform and and when people want to give money, uh, then it's okay, and if you don't, then uh, then, mm -hmm. then it's not. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of the of, of the responsibility of a platform in in also scanning, especially with equity or or, or loan campaigns, scanning the the profile of the of the entrepreneur, the business plan, the financials, mm -hmm. and that kind that of thing. Oh, I think, I mean, what we focus on at Indiegogo is, um, you know, we believe in open and we believe that the whole reason finance is inefficient is because of gatekeepers. And it's not that gatekeepers are trying to be evil or bad, they're not. <laughs> uh, most people who get into the investment business or become a banker get into it because they want to help ideas happen. But because of the, the inefficiencies in the system where they're only able to see so many deals and they, um, aren't, they're only right for certain types of deals, there's a lot of mismatching going on. And so in all of that mismatching, um, it's, it's the, the, the chance of an idea meeting their right investor goes very low. It's almost as if you had, you had to go on five dates and in those five dates, you had to meet your husband or wife or whatever. Like, when you only give yourself options of five people, the chance of you actually meeting the right person are, are very low. So you, you, if you open it up and make it far more efficient and you can meet all kinds of people and you're in a, a business that can meet all kinds of investors, the chance of you being able to find the right investor is higher. So, and that investor also wants to find you. And so, plus with gatekeepers, you have, everyone has their own world view, everyone has their own biases. And so if you just don't, if your bias is, is one that you believe this idea won't exist, then it has nothing to do with this idea. It's your bias that's determining in that. Yeah. And so there's just, that's the messiness of the, or that's the friction in the current process. Yeah. And so we believe in open, like let's remove the gatekeeper from the process, literally allow anybody to fund what, an idea they want to fund and what matters to them and then the ideas that do get funding are the ones that the world actually wants not the ones a few people think the world wants yeah. so in that regard for us then the responsibility that we believe in is um, our job what we, what we believe our job is first is help ideas find their audiences their true audiences whether those audiences are on on indiegogo or not like we have millions of people that come to Indiegogo every single day looking to fund stuff, but there are billions of people in the world. And so your idea might appeal to a ton of people already on Indiegogo, but there could be even more people not yet on that, that would love it. So our yeah. job is to get you to everybody, and that's what we believe. 
Um, the second thing is we, we think our job is really to provide the safest, cleanest environment where you thrive based on your own hard work and hustle and merit and nothing else. And so with that, you know, we've got a whole system to keep the site clean from fraudsters or people who are trying to take advantage, and so that's not a problem. Um, and we've built the communication to systems so that funders and campaign owners can talk directly to each other so you can learn as much as you need to learn before you make the decision to fund. And, and we believe in that open ecosystem because then the best ideas, the best debates, the best conversations happen and ideas move forward. Yeah. Um, in a transparent way. Yeah, yeah the reason also why, I'm, uh, why I was asking this question because uh, uh, with my campaign, my community based com campaign mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, uh, most people uh, they invested 20 euro, 40 euro, 100 euro. Mm -hmm. So there, there weren't really skilled uh, investors. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back, uh, the business plan, the plan was crap, the mm -hmm. validation was crap. So, so in the end, uh, nobody, even of me, uh, 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 get any return of the, uh, the project where they invested in. So. Uh, why I'm curious, uh, and also what we're asking the question was because I don't think, uh, especially when you look at equity-based crowdfunding campaigns, people have no idea what they're buying. So that's also why, uh, because they're not skilled investors. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just people who think, oh, cool, uh, I, I, I want to help you, I'll give mm -hmm. you money. Uh, but they, they have, then they have no idea what they're buying. Mm -hmm. So that's also well, why but that they're not was. skilled investors because they've never been able had they've never had the opportunity to learn how to do this because mm -hmm. that's been it's been an experience that they've been locked out of. Yeah. And so there'll be some education period. I mean, education is huge for us, and there's just going to be a learning period for people. Um, you know, in a way, because the laws have been written in the way they've been written, only the rich people have yeah. been able to invest in things, and regular people, not even like poor and regular middle income people, haven't. And so when you have the opportunity to invest in things, that comes an opportunity to learn how do you invest well, et cetera. And so you develop those skills. And so we're in this transitionary period where we're now giving the opportunity to regular people. And with that will come an opportunity for us and others to, to really educate people on what's the difference between funding and buying something. Funding is an idea that doesn't yet exist. And there's steps along the way, and there's plans, but things can go awry, and there's risk in that. So literally, it's about educating people about risk and what that means. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they'll just approach funding as if like they've been approaching buying, and they'll, they'll have the same expectations towards buying as they yeah. do towards funding. And, and that is probably, that is, um, will cause confusion and, and stuff. But that's the period that you know, we have to go through, because it takes time for yeah. people to learn. Yeah, yeah. 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 nice one. Mm -hmm. And you're also now uh, international, uh, mm -hmm. so, so uh, I yeah. back, uh, my, my, We've been my, my, international my since day one. Since day one, yeah. Since January 2008, <laughs> yes. So, so, uh, so you were already open for the world since since day one. Mm -hmm. Cool. And 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 what is your intentional growth uh, strategy? Because um, you are, I think, the, the your biggest market is now the US. Think, yeah, it? yeah, we're about probably around uh, two thirds or sixty or so percent of all of the campaigns and funding come from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but probably just has to do with the fact that we started here yeah, <laughs> and yeah. we have more awareness and stuff. But we um, we built our global payment system on the back end to be global and to work. So all you need wherever you are in the world is a bank account to get started. And again, that was very much in line with our. Our, our whole mission, which is to empower everyone to fund what matters to them. And you can't empower everybody if you're only in the U.S. Because mm -hmm. we're not the center of the world, even though a lot of Americans <laughs> like to think that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but so what we did, we built a system where we, we can exist everywhere and campaigns can exist. We, we have over, I think, 8,000 campaigns running at any given time. And we're on any given week, there's 70 countries that are funding. Um, Another reason to be open and global is that it gives our campaign owners the biggest reach to their audience. You know, you don't, if you're, if you're building a, we were just talking about, if you're building an open source camera, which we have on Indiegogo, you know, there are photographers and filmmakers all across the world that will want that open source camera. <laughs> so you want to be on a platform that helps you reach your global audience, not just your audience in your own country, because then that sets you up for the greatest amount of success. And so that's what we're really trying to do is, is create this global community of, 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 of creators and ideators and funders that are all coming together to make the things that they want to make. And, and how are you doing in, in Europe? Oh, good. We're, uh, Europe is like our our third largest kind of region of the world, second largest region of the world that's growing. So the UK, Germany, the, uh, the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, uh, 
uh, this, the, uh, the Nordics, the, you know, we've got campaigns everywhere. We have, I mean, we do have campaigns in Asia and Africa and everything too, but um, the entrepreneurial and creative spirit in Europe is really strong. So we're, wherever we, wherever that, that spirit is strong, we do well. Yeah. Um, yeah. We help people, and and when you look at the organization, uh, because I was tweeting with uh, some guys in, in Germany, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. uh, were uh, working for Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. at, at, at what way do you uh, uh, do the approach of the, of, of the growth in the country? So, like when you say, okay, I want mm -hmm. to grow in the Netherlands, uh, how do you do it? Yeah, um, it's what we found is that um, a lot of reasons people use Indiegogo is because they get the support that they need to like think through their campaign to. Um, get feedback on their marketing strategy and all this kind of stuff. We have people in house that do that. Um, we have a customer happiness team that gets back to you within 24 hours. We have um, an internal kind of strategy coach coaching team that gives people feedback and stuff. And so, what we're starting to do is is um, hire people um, to join our team that are actually physically based in um, different in the different regions. So they are on the ground. Um, again, providing the same coaching and feedback and strategy and tips and webinars and seminars and you know yeah. everything to bring the communities together. Allow a lot of times we do events where we just bring our customers together and serve on panels and the customers talk about what they did well, what worked, what didn't work, and build a community around that yeah. way. Yeah, and, and 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 how do you keep the the culture? Because then they got lots of people in different countries. Yeah, it's uh, well, a you hire the right people, which yeah, is people sure. who share your values. Because um, when those values are authentic to them, you don't have to teach them anything. They just get to be who they are, which is amazing. And when people are authentic to themselves at work, they're more productive and more happy. Um, and we do every uh, quarter we have an all hands where we bring the whole company to the headquarters in San Francisco. So we fly everybody in from across the world. And we talk about how we did this past quarter. We talk about our goals for the next quarter. Um, we do an Iggy's and Wiggy's exercise where we give everybody, everyone gets to give other people uh, an Iggy, which is like an award for really embodying one of our values. Mm -hmm. So that's one of everyone's favorite exercises. It's a time to like say thank you to your colleague and friend yeah. for being yeah. super fearless or yeah. authentic or uh, collaborative or empowering, which those are the four values that we have here. Um, and uh, we always have a bonding uh, uh, experience. So. Um, last uh, last time, I think we went out to the Marina Green and did this like team building uh, trust uh, exercises. Mm -hmm. We've gone wine tasting. We've um, we've done uh, lawn bowling together. It's just we played ultimate uh, frisbee and football or flag football. Mm -hmm. We just go out, have a barbecue, eat, mangle, hang out, get to know each other's people because yeah. we yeah. again we are hu human beings. Human beings first, Indiegogo people yeah. second. Yeah, yeah. That's nice one. And, and 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 like in the countries, do you hire one person or two persons so they're really a team and, and helping each other? Yeah. Eventually, we'd love to have that. We're still growing ourselves, and we have to be able to support it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so hopefully, hopefully, eventually, we'll have teams of people. Yeah. 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 Cool. I think it's really important that like, when we look at Europe because it's really going really fast uh, in crowdfunding Europe to, to, to really really tight on the market because there are so many yeah. other uh, uh, platforms so it's, it's really important to really be, uh, be, be visible I guess. Yeah. And uh, what do you think because crowdfunding I, I always see that, the, 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 that crowdfunding is, 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 is more mature than the sharing economy because crowdfunding really started uh, especially in the media uh, in the Netherlands, uh, about two, three years earlier than, than, than the sharing economy. What do you think uh, when you look at, 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 at crowdfunding are now, for the near future, the, the biggest challenges to make it a, a, a sustainable model for the future? Yeah, I think the, the you said the challenges or, um, well, I think for us, what, what we, the way to really become part of everyone's daily lives, which is the most sustainable way uh, you can be, um, is to really, what we're focused on is really working with the existing infrastructure. Um, so in a way, we're, we're a disruptive company in that we're, we're bringing a whole new way to bring ideas to life um, forward uh, and get them funded and everything, but um, we're doing it in a way where we're not threatening the incumbents. And so what Indiegogo has become is this incubation platform for the world. Uh, Ideas are rising up to the top in a very merit-based fashion, therefore making it easier for bankers or venture investors or even uh, movie producers to discover the emerging talent in a, yeah. in a merit-based and, and an efficient way. Um, because now we can use technology to funnel ideas to 
different traditional investors based on their criteria. And the ideas that are bubbling are ones that we know the world wants. So then it's just a matter of them get funneling them to the right investor based on yeah. their interests. And yeah. it's not such a, like, remember we were talking about, like, it's hit or miss, like, dating five people. You have to find your right partner. It's mm-hmm. like, ah, too much pressure. But um, if you know that, you know, what they're looking for and what, camp, what the businesses are looking for, then you can match make much more efficiently using yeah. technology. Yeah. So, and in that regard, then the ideas that end up really flourishing are the ones that earned it, mm-hmm. not the ones that a couple that got lucky yeah. and happened to know a gatekeeper. Yeah. Well, I think it's very interesting because you, uh, you started with, uh, with saying, okay, uh, I want to uh, 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 think about a way that people have access to capital because uh, your experience also with your parents. But in the end, uh, you also give some examples mm-hmm. about that uh, the, the, the Indiegogo crowdfunding campaigns weren't re- only about the money, but mm-hmm. there were a spark for something more, like you say, the, mm-hmm. the, the thousand dollar for the lawyer uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, to the mm-hmm. government. The same with why why we're here, uh, mm-hmm. because uh, yes, we uh, uh, needed the money to get here. But the most important mm-hmm. result of the crowdfunding campaign was the story getting more well known here in in San Francisco and and mm-hmm. and raising uh, the, the the appointment. So, what do you think about the different kind of failure that crowdfunding uh, leads to? Uh, uh, so the different kind of failure. Failure. Uh, value. Value. Yeah. So, 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 it, so. Yeah. Of course, uh, the, the money part is is is, is mm-hmm. important, mm-hmm. but uh, there are also lots of examples that that uh, maybe the biggest value isn't money, mm-hmm. but uh, the spark that is that will lead to other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's uh, I, and oftentimes people actually the money, the benefit of the money that you get from an Indiegogo campaign is like the third or fourth benefit of what you actually get. Um, what you, we've had campaigns that um, use Indiegogo even when they don't need the money and they then come because of the other things. And the other things are market feedback, market data, um, the support and just the positive <laughs> encouragement that you get. You know, as an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely road. Even as a creative entrepreneur, like a filmmaker, you have this vision and it's all on you to like manifest this vision and you, you can feel very alone sometimes. Um, so, and you know, we, we, we have Indiegogo Life now, which is a, a separate service purely for personal um, efforts or personal fundraisers. So if your dog just died or family member died or there's a memorial cost or if you have medical bills from an accident that you didn't foresee or maybe you're getting married or have a birthday party that you want to raise money for, um, we have a site now for that. And, Oftentimes the money is very important, but just the emotional support you get from all seeing that there's thousands of people who are behind you and want this to happen, that confidence is a huge benefit. Um, the other things like market data and feedback is also extraordinary, especially if you're like an, if you're an entrepreneur, for example, who's trying to bring a product to market. You have this hypothesis of what what need you're meeting, what what your solution, how your solution will solve that need how you should price it, all this kind of stuff. And we've had uh, campaigns that test all of those assumptions in their Indiegogo campaign and sometimes completely change their strategy or it reaffirms their strategy so they, when they launch the product, they know how to pr- they're pricing it um, the way they should and features, et cetera. A good example is um, the Misfit Shine, which was an activity tracker that um, the whole point of this uh, this design was to be elegant and to hide in your clothes. So the entrepreneur behind it wanted to make this elegant activity tracker so it wasn't a clunky bracelet they had to wear. And um, he launched his campaign. He actually had venture financing behind him. He launched Indiegogo campaign and ended up raising around $900,000. But in the process, he used Indiegogo's perk swapping functionality where he could change perks throughout the campaign. And because of that, he was, he was able to learn that people preferred the black version of his shine over the silver version and were willing to pay $50 more for the black than the silver because once the black version sold out, you could add another perk at a higher price point and see what, if people kept funding it. So, and then mid-campaign, all of his funders asked, like, why aren't you offering necklaces and bracelets? <laughs> And he uh, kind of wanted to argue with them because the whole point of the, sh- of the shine that he had designed was uh, to be uh, hidden, you know, and hidden yeah. your clothes. Like, why do you want it to be so ostentatious? So, um, so basically, he um, uh, he 
He's like, well, I'm fighting with my customers, so that's probably not the smartest thing to do. Let me put it to the test. In the middle of the campaign, he threw up a perk for necklaces and bracelets, and it got claimed overnight. And so he discovered a whole new revenue stream that he had never imagined and lit by, li allowing, by listening to his customers and testing their feedback. Not just believing it, but just literally testing it, putting it to the true test. So a lot of people say, oh, I'd buy that, I'd buy that, I'd buy that when you come out, yeah. and then it happens and they, there's no, they're nowhere yeah. to be seen. So it's a really good validation of who your market is. You get all this data, where your customers are, what countries they're in, what price points they're willing to pay. We had a campaign out of Australia that was uh, launching socks and a percentage of the proceeds were going to go to different charities. Well, they found that the willingness to pay in Australia was much higher than the willingness to pay in, the, in America because their American customers were funding at much lower levels than their Australian customers. And so it was just an interesting, it was interesting feedback to know so that when they were to launch in America, they're not going to launch with their most premium product. They're going to yeah. launch with yeah. a simpler, yeah. cheaper product. Yeah. So yeah. and that kind of um, data you just can't get from a venture capitalist or from a banker. They can't give you that kind of data. So in the end, you started with dream. Uh, about, I started with what? With a dream. Mm -hmm. So 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 to, to, to yeah. empower people to, get, to have access yeah. to capital. But now in the end, it's 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 much broader. So 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 now you're really empowering people people to to not only uh, turn in, turn in, into the capital, but to turn in to realize their dreams. Yeah, so really, we're really, really trying to help. Thing get these ideas going and, and make it, and the ideas that survive and thrive are the ones that earn it. Yeah. You know, it's, some people come and um, they use Indiegogo as a way to test an idea and they don't raise much money and we're, they're very thankful because they realize that the process of trying to raise money and not being able to show that they didn't have a market for what yeah. they were trying to do and they yeah. learned it in three weeks versus yeah. spending two years of their life on an idea that was going to die because there's no market. Yeah. So in a way we help accelerate the learning process and we make you smarter faster. So when you launch your business, whether it's a coffee shop or a restaurant or a gadget or whatever, you know who your customers are and you can be much more confident that you're serving them well versus hoping that you're going to serve them. Yeah. So we're making them better businesses too. Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks for the interview. It's yeah. a really, really amazing story. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.